Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I hope you're having a, a nice summer despite uh, our crisis in the country. And I hope you're all keeping safe. Uh, today, I would like to give you a gist of uh, uh, how the extraordinary detection of gravitational waves actually happens in the sense of how we manage to detect the compressions of space, which are so tiny. Uh, <clears throat> you must have already seen this picture many times about how, uh, hello? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, you must have already seen this picture uh, where you see coalescing black holes, uh, which uh, have, uh, we, we break down the, uh, in, the, the way the coalescence occurs into three phases. The first is called the in spiral phase. Then it's called, then uh, there is the merger phase. And then there is the post merger phase. Uh, perhaps some of you have also heard the way a gravitational wave sounds uh, in, uh, if you were to convert the signal that comes from the detector into an audible signal, it is called a chirp because uh, it is like uh, the chirping of a bird. Uh, which changes frequency as it passes. You might, I hope you have heard the sound. So the, you can see the time trace of that signal as the uh, black holes approach each other, the frequency, uh, the orbital frequency increases and uh, the the, the ripples in space-time also increase in frequency, and that's why we see a, uh, an, an increase in the uh, volume and frequency of the signal. Uh, how exactly is this signal produced? There are uh, a lot of wonderful uh, uh, simulations online. One of them is from this SXX, SXS collaboration. It's easily available on YouTube. I have posted the link here. Uh, you can see that these black holes are in orbit right now, and uh, they are quite far apart. They're zooming out. Uh, as the black holes approach each other, and uh, the, they begin to bend space-time, and the waves begin to go off in various directions, notice that uh, there are little triangles here, uh, little uh, ellipses here, which are changing in shape as the wave passes uh, their location. Uh, this is to give, imagine that these are some kind of uh, uh, flexible masses or they are suspended rings of masses and the position, uh, the distance between these masses is changing. And so uh, you see the uh, ellipse oscillating as the wave passes. But note that uh, in the plane of the orbital, uh, in the plane of the orbit, the ellipses oscillate whereas perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, the ellipse rotates. So in order to describe this uh, total behavior, <clears throat> we refer to something called polarization of the gravitational wave, which is a superposition of two different polarizations. <clears throat> now, as, we, as the black holes approach each other and they distort space-time even more, the ellipses stretch out further, so the signal grows stronger. <clears throat> Uh, let's move on to the, so as the, in the equatorial plane where you, where I pointed out that ellipses uh, stretch and compress, we have other, another uh, simulation. This is from the European Space Agency. And uh, if you take a, a tube of space going from the source to the detector, uh, the stretching and compression of the gravitational wave is uh, depicted here. If you look at any one of the ellipses, you see that it is stretching in the vertical direction and then compressing and then stretching again. Uh, this is the nature of the compression and the stretching of space, which uh, is caused by the passage of a gravitational wave in that region. Uh, so let's talk about how we are going to detect this. If you were to take that ellipse and uh, put some reference masses on it, 
and these masses should be free to follow the uh, compression of space as it happens. So in order to observe the compression of space, you need a third body, which is in the center, which acts as a reference for measuring the distance in the vertical and horizontal direction in this particular picture. Uh, and our objective then is to measure the distance between this uh, object called BS and the object called EMY, and the distance between BS and EMX, and then observe how these two distances evolve in time. And you might have noticed in the previous uh, video that uh, when uh, uh, EMY is moving away from BS, EMX will be moving towards BS as the ellipse stretches vertically. And it does the opposite thing when it stretches horizontally. To give you an idea of how much is the actual movement of an object which is following the ellipse, uh, if you were to have such objects on Earth and you had uh, a pair of uh, uh, 1.4 solar masses, uh, uh, black holes or, neut or neutron stars, uh, at uh, the distance of the Virgo cluster with an orbital radius, a radius of 20 kilometers, <clears throat> and, uh, and this will give rise to a frequency of orbit of about 400 hertz. If you had such a source, which is fairly far away, uh, you can calculate the amount of distortion of space. So this H is given as delta L by L. That is, if L is the length of this distance between BS and EMY, uh, excuse me, uh, then, uh, the change in the length is delta L, that is between the uh, two extreme positions of the ellipse. Uh, and the strain, the total strain of uh, strain, because it's a dimensionless quantity, uh, both the numerator and denominator being lengths. Uh, so this quantity is what we use for measuring the amount of distortion of space. So this distortion H turns out to be about 10 to the minus 21. And uh, it is an extremely small number. And if you were to calculate how much is the actual delta L shift, you have to multiply this by the length of your arm. And uh, in this case, let us say it's a kilometer long, then you would have 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, 10 to the minus 18 meters is pretty hard to detect because it is smaller than even the diameter of a neutron. Uh, or a nucleus. Uh, so how exactly are we going to do this? You notice already that uh, we use uh, a laser and uh, we form a, a Michelson interferometer with this uh, three masses. Uh, if we have the middle mass as a beam splitter, that's why it's called a PS. So the beam splitter would then send half the laser light towards EMY, that is end mirror Y, and then there's end mirror X. The light would bounce back, and then it would pass through the BS again and uh, reach the photodiode. Now, this particular instrument is naturally suited for detecting the fluctuations of H. Uh, so let's see how that is done. If here is your Michelson interferometer, and uh, you have the light rays going to the ends of the mirrors, EMY and EMX. And if a gravitational wave were to pass by, this is what you would see. The mirror would uh, oscillate. So let's see that again. Light splits, goes and comes back. And then when the mirrors oscillate, in the dark port, in this direction towards the detector, there is a fluctuation of light intensity. Why does that happen? because the light waves which are split and sent to the end mirrors have a property called phase, which uh, as you know, if it is, if light beams are in phase, they, uh, they add. And uh, if the light beams are out of phase, they subtract. So they can cancel each other and create darkness, even though both there are two light beams there. Uh, so you can see the change in the phase there and uh, between constructive and destructive interference, uh, 
you would be able to see the uh, intent change in the light intensity which would reach the detector so in the presence of a gravitational wave this is what we would see we would see a fluctuation in the dark port of the michelson uh, so this uh, uh, instrument is naturally suited for uh, detecting gravitational waves but we would like to increase the so we have a more elaborate instrument it's not a simple one like this so there is the basic structure of a these uh, uh, fabri ferro arm as long. Now, why do we use the fabric pair of arms? Because we protect the change in the length is uh, eventually uh, constructive and destructive interference towards the dark pole, which is here. And this is the photodiode, which uh, detects the gravitational wave readout. Uh, at this point, we want as much light as possible because when you have a slight fluctuation between two very large quantities, such as the, the amount of light power that is returning from the arms, the larger the light power that is returning, the more sensitive the, detect, the, the signal here is to fluctuations in the uh, arm length. So we want to capture as much power as possible. And as you can see, by successively uh, amplifying the laser uh, inside the optical cavities, we can reach about 750 kilowatts if we have an incident laser of about 125 watts. So we, uh, we will come back to this picture again, uh, as, as I can realize this is quite a complex picture in trying to understand all that is going on here. But this is the basic uh, uh, advanced LIGO optical configuration. You can read about uh, more details of the instrument in this article from plus two and quantum gravity published in 2015. The, in order to do this uh, exquisite measurement, what we have to do is to, uh, you know, a laser has a very uh, narrow line uh, of a very specific frequency, which means it has a very stable wavelength. And you can, uh, if you have a fabric cavity like this, that is uh, resonant with the laser, it means that the cavity is uh, an integral multiple of lambda by two, as you all know from your uh, school and college physics. Uh, as long as the lambda is very stable, the length can be controlled to be very stable if you know that uh, the laser is perfectly resonant with the fabric cavity. <clears throat> so the any deviation in the length of the cavity can also result uh, in an intensity fluctuation of the light that is reaching the detector. Uh, so holding the uh, fabri cavities in resonance with the laser is uh, the primary task of length control in uh, advanced LIGO. Not only the arms, but also the, all the other mirrors which form optical cavities, which are coupled to the arms, they also need to be controlled. Uh, so the, the basic uh, workhorse, which uh, does this job for us about how to uh, control the length of the arms is, uh, is the job of what is called a global length control subsystem of advanced LIGO. Uh, so the advanced LIGO, has these suspended mirrors. This picture is a cartoon of uh, the basic uh, global length control. We will see how it is, uh, what actually happens inside in a minute. Now the mirrors themselves are damped by, uh, let me see what's the time. Okay. 
so the mirrors themselves are damped by what's called a local control loop. They, we observe the motion of the mirrors with respect to the ground or with respect to another suspended mirror, and which is called a reaction chain. <coughs> Uh, we damp the mirrors so that they don't move uh, with respect to uh, the ground. And uh, we subsequently measure the distance between the mirrors using a special optical technique. Then when the distance changes, uh, I, there are many, many disturbing factors which, uh, which can change the position of the mirrors uh, due to local ground motion, due to variety of disturbances which can uh, give rise to noise in the length of, between the mirrors. And uh, we would like to counteract all those disturbances. So we have, we sense this change in the length and then we, so we need some kind of a length sensing scheme which is then used to feed back into the position of the mirrors and push them back into place. So that is the basic task of the length control system that we are talking about. As I mentioned just now, there are many uh, sources of noise in the interferometer. The seismic vibrations of the ground is one. Uh, residual gas in the long vacuum tubes which house the Fabry-Ferro arms and the entire detector, in fact, is uh, a major, is a contributing factor, which is now being suppressed by uh, reaching ultra high vacuum, a 10 to the minus nine tor in the arms. We have uh, a fundamental noise source known as the radiation pressure, which occurs due to the, the nature of light. Uh, the particulate nature of light gives rise to what is called photon fluctuations. Uh, and it, it gives rise to uh, a fluctuating radiation pressure on the mirror, which can shake the mirror. Uh, and also uh, the fluctuations of the light itself reach the photo detector and give rise to uh, photon short noise in the gravitational wave detector that's here. So there are a number of these sources and uh, we have to understand and uh, find ways to reduce these length, length uh, noise. The basic building block of the LIGO interferometer is called the pound river hall technique. This is what we use for sensing the length of the arms, length, length, length of the fabric into the uh, arms of the detector. Uh, the objective of this is to ensure that the fabric cavity is in optical resonance with the laser. And uh, so therefore the length of this uh, the distance between these two mirrors is an integral multiple of lambda by two. And the job of this guy is to hold that condition down to the sensitivity we require, which is better than 10 to the minus 18 uh, meters. So that is the challenge. That is to hold this four kilometer long arm stable down to 10 to the minus 18 meters. And uh, how exactly we do that is uh, one of the uh, major advances which was made with the help of uh, uh, the pound driver hall technique. In the pound driver hall technique, we have, a, we have the main laser and uh, the light from the laser is incident on the cavity. But in between, we introduce what is called the electro-optic modulator. The electro-optic modulator is a, an optical device, which whose, uh, so it's like a, a crystal, whose uh, refractive index can be changed by applying an electric field. Now, if you have an oscillating electric field, uh, then this uh, light passing through this device will be uh, retarded and the retardation is changing in time. So the phase of the light changes in time that imposes what we call side bands onto the light. So this is a phase modulated light that is incident on the, on the cavity. The reflected part of the, so as the cavity is tuned, light enters the cavity and begins to resonate inside. And it builds up power because the, uh, it takes uh, several round trips for the light before it can escape. These are high reflectance mirrors with the transmissivity of less than 10 to the minus four in the end mirrors. 
and in the <coughs> uh, incident mirror, input mirror, uh, the transmittance is a few percent. Uh, so let us the the actual uh, mathematics of this technique uh, is described in several uh, articles. I have uh, mentioned here this is a nice reference by Eric P. Black. It's a standard uh, article which all of us read for understanding the pound driver hall technique. It can be a little daunting because uh, it in it uh, addresses uh, many, many aspects of the <clears throat> of the technique. Uh, the original paper is here in 1983. Uh, Ron Drever and uh, other authors published this paper. And that's also a very nice reference to read because the fundamental concepts are very nicely explained there. Wikipedia has a nice article. Uh, I would encourage you to read it because I think uh, it is in a very compact and uh, organized form. Uh, you can also read uh, uh, this SJSU uh, article. So there are several references for following the details. What I would concentrate on here is uh, the basic conceptual blocks which go into the PDH technique because uh, there are several interconnected concepts. And I would like to separate them out for you so that it's easier for you to understand when you read the reference material. There are three, three conceptual blocks. Uh, some, of, uh, some of this may be new to you, some of them, some of you may be familiar with this. There is something called a phase sensitive detection technique that is used uh, uh, almost in uh, all experimental physics everywhere where you make a sensitive detection. We use this technique for detecting extremely small fluctuations. Uh, then there is the PDH sensor, the pound driver hall sensor, which involves uh, learning something about how the light fields interact with fabric or cavities. Then using these two techniques, we uh, go through a feedback control process, which holds the cavity at its resonance length. So it is the interaction of these three concepts which you need to understand in order to appreciate how the pound driver hall technique works. Let us first go to the phase sensitive detection. It's a very general technique. Uh, you can think of it as a way to extract very small signals from a, a large amount of background noise. Now assume that uh, you have some physical system which is characterized by two parameters. One is called the gain G and other is called the phase phi. The essence of gain G and phi is that if there is a, a, a sinusoidal wave, as you know, any random time varying input can be broken down by Fourier decomposition into a sinusoidal, a set of sinusoidal waves. So it's sufficient to consider a simple case of sinusoidal waves to explain the principle. Suppose you had a sinusoidal wave of omega, uh, frequency omega, and an amplitude A incident on the system. This is what is exciting the system. And uh, the system then generates an output, which is of a different magnitude. A can get attenuated or amplified or whatever. So uh, the wave emerging from the system is of amplitude B, and it is also phase retarded by angle phi. <clears throat> so, uh, the ratio of B by A is uh, essentially our uh, quantity G, the gain, and the phase retardation introduced is uh, the phase phi. This in general encompasses a wide variety of behavior of physical systems. Now, let's see how we need to extract the two physical properties G and phi in a very efficient manner. If you take the sine, incident sine wave, and split it two ways. You let one pass through the system and emerge as B sine omega T plus phi. The other bypasses the system and ar arrives at the end of the chain. And uh, here you multiply them by using what is called a mixer. So usually this uh, uh, omega that we are talking about is uh, in radio frequencies, megahertz or, or so. Uh, kilohertz, megahertz. So you can find a, a device to multiply the two and generate a output uh, 
whose frequency components are here. Uh, if you, this is a simple derivation that you can do with uh, three, four lines. If we multiply two sine waves, a sine omega t and t sine omega t, what you get is half a b cos a minus b plus sine a, a plus b. So <clears throat> the cos a minus b knocks off the omega t and it retains only five, whereas the a plus b uh, gets two omega t plus five. Uh, so following the uh, signal, uh, we impose a, a low pass filter with a frequency cutoff, which is much less than two omega. This knocks off the, uh, the two omega t term, uh, which then uh, leaves behind a constant, uh, a, a constant in time, which is proportional to this uh, proportional to the incident and uh, amplitudes, uh, incident and transfer amplitudes, as well as the cos of the uh, phase angle. Now, this is okay as long as, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the phi is not close to 90. If the phase delay is close to 90, then the signal would go to zero. So we need a way to extract the signal even when the phase is close to 90. And so what we do is we actually shift the incident beam, incident uh, frequency by pi by two and uh, multiply that. And we extract from this what is called a quadrature phase. Uh, we have uh, therefore what is called an in-phase component that is when the phi is small and B sine omega t is almost in phase with A sine omega t. And we have another component where uh, phi is close to 90. And so we call that something which is 90 degrees away and therefore it is a quadrature away. Quadrature meaning one fourth of a circle. Uh, so having these two components, the I and the Q component, we can now extract from it the gain and the phase by a simple combination of i square plus q square square rooted and so on. <clears throat> so this is the uh, basic uh, workings of a phase sensitive detection technique. You can use this for uh, whether you're detecting uh, uh, radio waves in your handset or uh, any other fine signal. The advantage is that if there is any deviation of any other disturbance, let us say some other disturbance is coming into the system and uh, introducing some noise, Unless that happens at exactly the same frequency omega t, uh, it will get filtered out in this uh, uh, low pass filter because uh, this first term, uh, which uh, cos omega t, you remember that it, we had an a minus b term here where omega t had was subtracted from the two. So any disturbance that is not at omega will be heavily suppressed by this filter. So what you see at the output is only what you introduced in the beginning at the exactly the same frequency. <clears throat> uh, so how do we use that technique in our pound river hall measurement? We, our job in the pound river hall measurement, as I mentioned earlier, is to compare, uh, is to hold the fabry perot cavity at the resonance condition. That means it has to be an exact multiple of the lambda by two. <clears throat> So uh, if either lambda changes or the length changes, we want to know about it. <clears throat> and we do have uh, laser frequency noise as well as cavity length noise. Uh, and we want to discriminate against all fluctuations which arise from local sources because we are only interested in the actual compression of space which happens between the input and end mirrors. <clears throat> Let us say there is a frequency F cavity which characterizes the resonance frequency of the uh, cavity at a nominal cavity length of L cavity. If we take this as our baseline and this is the point where at which we want to hold it, so the laser has to be matched to F cavity and uh, L cavity has to be an integral multiple of lambda by two. The job of the pound river hall signal is to detect the mismatch between or any deviation from this condition between the laser and the input mirror. The way we do that is as uh, we just now talked about it in the uh, uh, 
phase sensitive detection case, we introduce a sinusoidal signal into the input of the system. We uh, into the uh, into the light fields between the laser and the uh, fabric pair of cavity. We introduce the electro optic modulator, and we pump an RF signal into the electric field in which the EOM is immersed, and it causes a phase fluctuation, uh, a time varying phase fluctuation, a sinusoidal phase fluctuation, which then is incident on the cavity, and the reflected light from the cavity is captured by the photodiode. The two signals, uh, the signal at the, uh, the, the you, you see this uh, generator. The generator is essentially the output of the generator. One branch is going to the EOM. The other branch is going to be mixed with the photodiode. The mixer is essentially a multiplier, which multiplies these two signals. Then we low pass filter it. And we have here a, a sensitive measure of the deviation of the, uh, uh, frequency or length matching condition between the laser and the input frequency. So this signal, which is called the pound river hall signal, is uh, extremely sensitive to fluctuations in the length of the cavity. The, uh, as you can see, the very close to zero, the signal is having a very steep slope. That means any small deviation from here from zero implies zero being the nominal length of L cavity. Any small deviation from that gives rise to a sharp rise or drop in the PDH signal. So this is a sensor that we use for detecting the length changes of, or frequency fluctuations of the, uh, bit, uh, of the mismatch between this. We call uh, uh, such uh, uh, mismatches as detuning because a tuned resonator is in resonance. So even whenever the resonator goes out of resonance, we call it detuning of the resonator. So detuning can occur either because the frequency of the laser has drifted away or because the length of the cavity has drifted away from L cavity. So our job is then to control both the frequency and the length. So the way we do that is here is the laser and the input to, to input and end mirror forming the fabric of cavity. The PDH sensor senses the mismatch between the laser and the cavity. We split the signal into a low frequency component towards the right and a high frequency component towards the left because our ability to, uh, there are multiple reasons why exactly we do this. Uh, the simplest one is that uh, our, uh, the ability to actuate on a mirror and push it uh, decreases with frequency because the mirror resists more motion at high frequencies. Whereas the laser is uh, much more amenable to high frequency actuation. So we send the high frequency branch towards the laser. HPF is a high pass filter, LPF is a low pass filter. Uh, the servo filters are control loops. So this is where we talk about the feedback control, where we are pushing the laser and the end mirror and the length of the cavity back to where they should be. Uh, this kind of a scheme is uh, very common in LIGO where we use uh, the properties of the physical system to for our advantage. For example, uh, the Fabri-Pero cavity has, is, is like a, uh, a low pass filter in itself because if uh, the, the cavity like any resonator has a certain time constant. And uh, if uh, there are frequency fluctuations or length fluctuations at frequencies above the uh, time constant, the cavity acts as a low pass filter and integrates those. So at high frequencies, the cavity is a very stable length reference, but high frequencies meaning beyond the uh, uh, corner frequency of the, or the frequency uh, time constant time frequency corresponding to the time constant of the system. Uh, the laser, however, uh, has uh, a lot of high frequency noise. So the high frequency branch, therefore, uses the cavity length as a reference and, and uh, forces the laser to follow the cavity at high frequencies. At low frequencies, however, uh, we want the cavity length to slowly follow the frequency drift of the laser, which is a relatively, the, the mean frequency drift of the laser drift slowly. 
and it is easy for us to follow it at low frequencies. So we push the mirrors to follow the laser at low frequencies. So this is a, a typical uh, laser cavity lock that is used across uh, many branches of physics, not, not only in uh, uh, LIGO. In LIGO, we have uh, the, a, a powerful uh, infrared laser at uh, 1064 nanometers, 1064 nanometers. And this is the laser, a picture of the uh, room where uh, the laser is contained. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, optics and electronics goes into this system. Uh, let us look at look at a schematic of this. Uh, the uh, pre-stabilized laser, um, it's called pre-stabilized because even before it arrives at the interferometer, it's already stabilized by filtering it through and locking it to multiple stabilized cavities. So optical cavities are used as a frequency reference in this case, uh, frequency and intensity references. The primary low, long frequency reference is this thing called the reference cavity, which is a fixed length uh, cavity inside a vacuum can. It's about a foot long. Uh, and this cavity, as you see this PD4, is essentially taking the light of the uh, laser and comparing it with the fixed fixed cavity reference. And a pound river hall scheme is used for frequency stabilizing the initial laser out here, which is called the N-PRO. N-PRO stands for a non-planar ring oscillator. It's a certain geometry of the laser, which gives rise to a very stable uh, tunable laser. Uh, it's a single crystal whose length can be changed by uh, either heating it slightly or uh, by thermal expansion or by compressing it by mechanical force. Uh, So there are uh, amplifiers which amplify this about uh, three watt laser to about 35 watts in the first stage of the amplifier. This is not a cavity, it's a single pass. Um, then we come to the high power oscillator, uh, which is an optical cavity within which there are amplifiers again. And this was amplified to uh, several hundred, uh, sorry, about a hundred watts. Uh, and uh, then uh, we hit our first stabilization cavity, which is called a pre-mode cleaner. The mode cleaner uh, is a, a bowtie Fabry-Ferro cavity. And once again, you see the PD-1 and PD-2. These are used, uh, uh, PD-2, for example, is uh, used for uh, uh, controlling the frequency such that uh, the laser and this cavity are locked together. Uh, our first large reference of the frequency comes from what's called the input mode cleaner. This is a triangular cavity of about 16 meters long. And this has suspended mirrors and therefore it is very quiet at high frequencies. And therefore we use this for this uh, PSL frequency control. This, this frequency control loop is uh, used for uh, stabilizing the laser. After this, it goes to the interferometer from here. Going forward into the interferometer, there are even more of these pound river hall sensors all over the interferometer to control various length of lengths in the interferometer. In the interferometer, we have the arms and uh, we have what is called the short Michelson because the long Michelson is all the way to the end of the arms. The short Michelson is to the ITM X and ITM Y. Uh, then we have what is called a power recycling cavity. Uh, which is this PRM is the power recycling mirror. And uh, the power, if the light beam towards the dark port is suppressed by destructive interference, the light beam towards uh, returning towards the laser becomes very bright and we don't want to waste that power. So uh, we put a mirror here and bounce it back into the cavity. This forms a power recycling cavity whose length needs to be sensed and controlled. So we have multiple uh, photodiodes <clears throat> and uh, these photodiodes are uh, at various sideband frequencies and we demodulate the photodiode signal at uh, sometimes the fundamental fre uh, modulation frequency or sometimes two times the modulation frequency or three times the modulation frequency for detecting and separating out the effects of various cavity lengths in the interferometer. 
interferometer has five fundamental cavity lengths that we need to control. And each of them needs to be sensed separately and suppressed. Uh, so we have all these are uh, typical photodiode names. The raffle is in the reflection port. Uh, raffle 9 means raffle uh, reflection port photodiode at 9 megahertz, at 27 megahertz, 45 megahertz, 135 megahertz, and so on. Uh, we have uh, an interferometer has four ports. Uh, it has, of course, the ports which are uh, coming towards uh, the dark port where the main photodiode is. Uh, we have uh, things which are bouncing back towards the laser. So that is the input port and we have the output port and uh, we have the arms. Uh, <clears throat> we have detectors in all these ports. All of them are trying to uh, sense the various degrees of freedom of the laser, of the, of the cavity. And uh, eventually we suppress the fluctuations of these cavities down to 10 to the minus 18. And that's when we begin to see uh, light intensity fluctuations pertaining to gravitational wave forces. So what we have plot, typically LIGO analyzes the signal uh, which is received in the dark port. What you see here is a strain uh, versus frequency. And the dark line, the black line here is the total intensity uh, fluctuations you see in the dark port. Those uh, intensity fluctuations have been interpreted and calibrated to give you the strain, which is the physical quantity that we wish to observe. As you can see, the sensitivity uh, typically reaches 10 to the minus 23. Uh, however, we do what is called noise budgeting in order to identify the contribution of various noise sources in the detector. And we, once we know that a, a noise source is dominant in a certain region, we concentrate on reducing and working on that particular noise source. For example, in this particular plot, we see that uh, uh, the photon, the quantum noise, which is uh, another name for the photon shot noise, <clears throat> or the radiation pressure fluctuations, the source of which is again the nature of light. Uh, these are uh, the limiting noise sources, both in high frequency and in low frequency in certain frequency bands. However, if you come to something around uh, 80 Hertz or so, you see that the limiting noise source now is uh, uh, what is called coating Brownian noise. This is a major problem that uh, LIGO is facing now. Uh, the thermal noise inside the coatings is one of the, uh, is a, a serious uh, limiting noise at this time. At very low frequencies, we hit something called the seismic wall, which is due to the seismic noise of the ground, which we are unable to filter out below 10 Hertz or so. So it's very hard to shift the, uh, limited low frequencies. Uh, in, in order to proceed ahead, we need to work on all these various different kinds of noise sources. And there is ongoing research on uh, all of these aspects uh, in order to reach the next generation of detectors. Uh, this is a plot uh, from a little while ago, uh, the actual data from the detectors, which is showing you the sensitivity curves of uh, uh, Livingston and Hanford detectors. Uh, you can see that uh, in the, uh, what we call the bucket, which is the actual detection uh, range of frequencies, which is about uh, 30, 40 Hertz onwards to a few kilohertz, the uh, intense, the, the strain noise uh, reduces below 10 to the minus 23. Uh, you must have appreciated by now that uh, the, the job of controlling the detector involves multiple fields. And so uh, everybody and anybody who has expertise in uh, basic engineering or sciences or uh, basic physics, all of it is contributing to, uh, all of it is a necessary contribution to achieving the sensitivity we reach. Uh, if you think of it as three main branches, uh, optics, electronics, and mechanics, Every overlap of optics and mechanics, like optomechanical instruments, uh, optoelectronic instruments, all of that becomes a contributing factor in the uh, detection of the gravitational waves. So I encourage you, uh, regardless of which branch of engineering or science that you come from, all of your expertise is uh, very welcome. 
and necessary for the interferometer to work. Uh, I would like to stop here and take some questions. I don't hear anything. I see some chat. Okay. Uh, Madhura has asked, why do we require long arms in LIGO? Why can't we have it smaller? Of course, it is cheaper to have it smaller. So let me go back to the slide uh, where I spoke about the sensitivity of the detector. How do I go there? Okay, here we are. Uh, you notice that the strain which we want to measure uh, causes a certain change in the length of the arm, delta L. And for a given strain of 10 to the minus 21, say, delta L is larger. That is on the left-hand side, you have 10 to the minus 21. And uh, you, you want to increase this delta L, which is the observed motion of the mirror, till the mirror motion becomes actually observable. And if, uh, so what is the length motion, what is the length fluctuation that your instrument can actually observe? Uh, if you say that the length fluctuation that you can observe is 10 to the minus 18, then you need to have a correspondingly large length in the denominator in order to give you a 10 to the minus 21. So this is essentially the driving factor. So the, the length noise that you have in the arms decides what is the minimum delta L that you can observe. And if you have a certain lower cutoff for the observable delta L, that forces you to increase the denominator L so that you can observe a strain of 10 to the minus 21 or better. That is the reason why we have large interferometers. Okay, let me check the chat again. So the, power, the role of the power recycling mirror is, uh, sorry, power recycling cavity is uh, to uh, enhance the amount of light which is trapped inside the interferometer. Okay, uh, Junik Sengupta has asked uh, two questions. Uh, what will happen if two gravitational waves hit at the same time? So the gravitational waves follow the superposition principle. So you would detect both of them at the same time, but it's highly unlikely that they would come from the same source. So they would have slightly different characteristics if they come from different parts of the sky or if they have a uh, different time evolution. So we can differentiate them based on those. How does the gravitational wave, how long does the gravitational wave continue? That depends on the kind of source we're talking about. We have persistent sources which can last a long time. For example, uh, if you have a asymmetric neutron star, they, they can form continuous uh, uh, con uh, asymmetric spinning neutron star. Then you can have a continuous gravitational wave which can last uh, decades. Uh, or you can, if you have an in-spiral, uh, depending on the masses of the inspiring uh, candidates, candidate black holes or neutron stars, then the signal can change in length. It can be from uh, a fraction of a second to several minutes. Uh, sir, when LIGO used optical cavity to increase the power of the reflected laser beam, how will it sense the 750 watt power and let the laser come out of the cavity? So the 750 watts, no, 750 kilowatts of power does not come out of the cavity, only a small portion of it leaks out. 
and uh, we can uh, pick off a portion of that beam using a, a mirror which has so typically we have anti reflection coated surfaces of let us say the beam splitter uh, the anti reflection coated surface will reflect only a few parts per in a million so that reflects a few watts from the uh, from the uh, roughly 3 quarters of a megawatt of power in the arms and uh, Sorry, the beam splitter is in the power recycling cavity. So there the power is not so high. Inside the arms, we do not have any pickoffs. So we can just monitor the power outside the cavity. Uh, we don't need to actually detect the 750 watts because all we need to detect is the destructively interfered dark port light. We don't need to detect the watts inside the cavity itself. Um, if we have a source nearby, then the wavelength of detection of sources increases. Uh, you're talking about the wavelength of the gravitational waves. So that is decided by the orbital frequencies and not by the nearness of the source. However, the nearness of the source will, of course, increase the amplitude of the gravitational wave. And I can certainly say that we don't want something too near to us because it will just rip us apart. So, yeah. Any other questions? Let's see, we are 10 minutes away from the end of the time. Why we use an IR laser? Interestingly, initially it was thought that the shorter the wavelength of the laser, the better it is because uh, after all, a shorter laser will immediately give you uh, a more accurate comparison of length. Uh, so initially, they started using green lasers at 512 nanometers. However, green lasers have multiple problems. Uh, one is that uh, the higher the frequency of the laser, the greater is the energy carried by each of its photons. And when you have megawatts of power at uh, a high frequency laser, that begins to damage the optical coatings much more easily. This can, uh, over time, uh, deteriorate the performance of the interferometer. Secondly, the uh, uh, NDAG laser in the N-PRO configuration is a very narrow line laser, which is extremely stable in frequency and intensity. And it's very smoothly tunable. So it has many nice characteristics, which allow us to create a very, uh, uh, very stable, stable in frequency and intensity laser, which is much more, uh, which is capable of reaching much higher powers at the very same uh, levels of uh, low frequency and intensity noise. That's the, for the nice characteristics of the uh, 1064 nanometer laser it was chosen. Is there a lower limit to which we can decrease noise due to the very nature's uncertainty? Uh, yes and no. Uh, in the sense, there are fundamental limits to what we can do. Some of these limits are imposed upon us by the site. Uh, you can argue that, okay, we can go to some other site where uh, you have lesser noise, like for example, space. But eventually you will run into fundamental limits imposed by things like the thermal noise or, the, or uh, things like uh, uh, the radiation pressure fluctuations. Uh, these, to an extent, can be circumvented, and uh, squeezed light technology is one of those which circumvents the photon shot noise at high frequencies and radiation pressure noise at low frequencies by utilizing something known as the frequency-dependent squeezing, which is a currently ongoing effort at both the LIGO sites and globally. So questions are flowing in faster than I can catch up. Okay, so Jaswant Yadav asks, are, are the sources detected by LIGO extragalactic? How do we know? So a lot of sources detected by LIGO are extragalactic. Uh, the, the reason is uh, gravitational waves uh, are not attenuated by intervening matter. They can travel tremendous distances without losing a, a lot of, of the energy that is contained in the wave. And also remember that uh, 
uh, gravitational waves detected by uh, a LIGO detector or an interferometer is detecting the amplitude of the, of the gravitational wave and not the intensity of the gravitational wave. Now, the amplitude of a gravitational wave or any wave drops off with, uh, as one over the distance. So the attenuation of the signal with distance is lesser. So you can see the sources to a very great distance. In fact, if we uh, build detectors of uh, sensitive at lower frequencies, we can detect gravitational waves all the way to the beginning of time. Uh, how do we know? We know because we can measure the distance of the source by looking at the nature of the gravitational wave signal that was received. We do what is called source modeling. Uh, by observing the gravitational wave that we have received, we can work backwards to recreate what is the source. And given such a source, we can, we can uh, estimate how far it has to be, how far away it has to be in order to generate such a signal. <clears throat> we can also, uh, if we are lucky enough, as we did, uh, detect uh, one source in also in other telescopes, like optical and radio telescopes, then we have a uh, what we call multi-messenger astronomy, where we detect uh, as the same source in multiple uh, frequency bands, multiple uh, detectors like telescopes, uh, and then we can estimate a distance much more accurately, and we can actually compare the speed of the gravitational wave versus the speed of light. And this is a very interesting measurement to make. And this was made, and it was shown that they travel pretty much at the same frequency, at uh, the same speed. What changes, so Anirban is asking, what changes can be done if we replace current laser with squeezed states of light? Uh, this is a, an ongoing effort. We have already got a squeezer working in both the sides. Uh, the technology for squeezing light is about uh, 15, 20 years old. And uh, we do employ the squeezers to reduce the photon short noise in the dark port. Uh, that is where the photo detector detects the light fluctuations. We cannot replace the laser. Uh, what we do is to add a squeezer. We add a squeezed beam of light in order to suppress the phase fluctuations coming from background space. Uh, Madhusudan is asking several questions. No, one question. Uh, what is the effect of local electric and magnetic fields on sensitivity? How can we rectify them? Yeah, good question. So we have, we take a, a lot of care to see that uh, local disturbances do not affect our measurement. Uh, for example, magnetic fields. Many of our uh, uh, mirrors have uh, little magnets stuck on them. So they are in principle, uh, they can respond to local magnetic field fluctuations. However, the magnets are stuck in a certain way such that the net magnetic dipole of the uh, device is zero. So it does not respond to DC magnetic field fluctuations. It can respond to high frequency magnetic field noise, but then the suspension becomes insensitive to a driving force which is at high frequencies. So by we, we always keep track of uh, what the local disturbances are doing. In fact, there is an entire subsystem of LIGO which is dedicated to measuring the effects of the local electric fields and magnetic fields and uh, making sure that they do not disturb the detector. It's called the physical environment monitoring system. Divya is asking, doesn't that limit the observation limit of gravitational waves? I'm afraid I don't know what you mean by that. What is that which you're talking about? So you'll have to explain to me what that is. Uh, Space-based detector will increase our range of detectors and we can go to lower noise range than the current limit. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we already have a space-based uh, detector uh, proposal at work. It is uh, called LISA. It's a European Space Agency and NASA collaboration. Uh, it is scheduled to go up uh, in 2035 or so. It's a very complex instrument to build and maintain. 
Um, some of the technology that we need to build it was tested in a Pathfinder mission called the LISA Pathfinder. So it's a, uh, technologically, it is now well understood. Um, they're solving power, they're solving uh, some other issues of how to build the satellites and send them up. And yes, uh, the frequency range in which such uh, detectors will work is uh, about a couple of orders of magnitude lower than uh, ground-based detectors. And they will detect a different kind of sources. For example, they will detect supermassive black holes uh, going around each other. They can detect uh, 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 more primordial sources and so on. So, Uh, it is not a replacement of the ground-based detectors. It is a complementary frequency band. And one advantage of that is that, uh, you know, in the in-spiral phase, the frequency of the uh, coalescing black holes will be, the orbital frequency is much lower. So they will be picked up in the uh, LISA much before, years before uh, it would be detected on the ground. So there will come a time when we know that a gravitational wave coalesce, sorry, a coalescence of binary black holes or neutron stars is about to happen and we can actually tune our detectors to point in that direction exactly and be ready for detecting the coalescence. So can we direct LIGO in a particular direction to study waves from a particular source? So LIGO is not like a telescope that you can steer, uh, but by if you have multiple LIGO, you, you think of LIGO not as a telescope, but like a radio antenna, which is kind of fixed in on the ground. But by observing the relative phase of the signals received at two detectors, one can infer the location of the source in the sky. So if you take the data that has been recorded and then you analyze it such that you look at signals which could come from a certain direction. It is like pointing your attention towards one part of the sky. So in that sense, it is steerable in your data analysis, not in the physical system. And also the uh, signal that uh, the, the detector receives is, uh, it has a very large solid angle. So you cannot, using the detector signal alone, you will be finding it hard to locate the source in the sky. That's why you need an array of detectors in order to reduce the solid angle at which your detectors as a network points. And this is the reason why we are actually uh, planning on uh, installing a detector in India, because it gives you long, long baselines for doing triangulation and location of sources. Uh, what is the reason of why we have not detected gravitational waves in our own galaxy? Uh, I believe we have, I'm not sure. But uh, so we, there is no reason why we, should, we cannot. It is just that uh, when you reduce the volume of space in which you want to detect stuff, then uh, the number of possible sources available within that volume decreases. Uh, and uh, so as the number goes down, the probability that something will be detected within a given observation time decreases. So it's just a matter of probabilities rather than anything else. So there is no reason why we cannot detect something from our own galaxy. Uh, gravitational waves, what other info can we have about the source except velocity and mass? Yeah, so a lot of information can be probed uh, by observing the, by reconstructing the source based on the observed data. Such as, uh, for example, what is the, uh, how much does, if you take a neutron star, we can ask, as neutron stars approach each other and there is tidal deformation of the neutron star, how stiff is the neutron star? Then that gives you an insight into what is the equation of state of the matter inside the neutron star. 
So this is like particle physics. We can actually under ask fundamental questions about the nature of material interactions, the nature of how very dense matter behaves. We can ask questions about uh, the validity of uh, Einstein's theory in extreme spaces, extreme uh, uh, gravitational potential. Uh, and uh, we can ask, uh, we can test many of the theories in, ex in uh, extreme situations, which is a good way to find weaknesses in the theory. And to, you know, a, a theory is a, a theory is valid only in the domain where experiments and observations have validated the theory. So if you don't know what happens at extreme gravity, uh, you cannot extend the theory to that point. And uh, extending uh, GT, uh, general relativity to early space times uh, in the beginning of the Big Bang, you have to know and be able to uh, uh, bet on the fact that the same theory holds under those extreme gravity situations. So from that point of view, uh, expanding the domain of validity of the theory is very crucial for understanding the origins of our universe. I think we are running into the next lecture. So I would like to uh, take a break now and then perhaps you would also get a little bit of time before the next uh, lecture by Mansa starts in half an hour. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for your attention. And it's been a great audience. I have enjoyed uh, the questions, very nice questions. I encourage you to continue thinking about uh, both uh, the physics as well as the technological challenges of gravitational waves. And we hope to see you back here at Ayuka in the not too distant future. Thank you. Bye-bye.